Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack, and we're working on our series, 101 Verses, Proving Faith Alone. And we're, uh, we're on, I think, number 54 on our list today. So we've already covered a lot of ground. And I hope if you haven't seen all the previous videos on this subject, you will go to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and find the playlist and, and watch this from the beginning. I think it also could be helpful if, if you know somebody that doesn't understand that salvation is a free gift and religious works on our part are, are not required. Uh, if they don't understand that, this probably would be an excellent playlist to, to send them. So uh, my brother Jason Jack with me. Any opening thoughts here before we get started? All right, brother, the, the verse we're going to start off with today is Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. All right, brother. You got a lot to, lot of thoughts in there. Go ahead. short of the glory of God because you haven't rested in his promise. Uh, 
you haven't received eternal life, if you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ alone. Now you have, and then these false prophets are coming back in and telling you you have to be under the law now, and you're a babe in Christ, and you're, you're being tossed to and fro, you know, you're not grounded and settled in Scripture, and, and our standing to stand back in your faith in Jesus Christ, then it's going to get you back under the yoke of bondage, and you're going to be falling from grace in that sense. Um, so either way, obviously, it's a no-no that Paul is telling um, the church at Galatia. Before before I comment on all this, uh, I'd just like to ask you about the last part. It says, "Ye are fallen from grace." Could that be construed as a person losing their salvation? No, <laughs> um, because here, if if you're fallen from grace, like I said, you're you're a debtor to the law. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior alone, and then are getting mixed up then you've fallen from the grace of God. You haven't lost your salvation. You're just not under God's grace. You're you're trying to establish your own righteousness, and you're getting mixed up and confused, and you need to get out of that. Um, so that's why, and there's some people that work with that. I mean, that's why Paul is right to the church, because there were some that were being mixed up with this, and he's trying to, you know, get them out of that. So that they can rest and be assured. There's no assurance that getting back under the law, that leads to confusion and doubt. You don't know if you're saved, if you're not saved. You're not fully put my trust in so long. I've been working for salvation now. I don't know if I'm saved or not. You know, there's no assurance to that. But if you know the true gospel and rest in it, and know it's not of works and it's not of the law, then you can be assured of your salvation. You can have peace. That's what God wants. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. Um, and so that's what Paul is writing to the Galatians, so that they can rest and be at peace in their salvation through what Jesus Christ did for them. Because he knows that's going to go unto them being profitable to others and pleasing to God a lot more than if they're trying to do it themselves. Uh, there's no peace and assurance in that. But no, you can't fall from grace in the sense of losing salvation. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's a debate today and that, that can be traced back to the, the this beginnings of the church and these even these epistles, we see this mentioned. And that is, what is the true status of Paul? Um, Paul defends himself as an apostle. And why would he do that? It's because there are uh, some people who are challenging him, his authority and his legitimacy as an apostle. They're challenging his teaching as, as, as wrong and heretical. So from then and even today, we have some people that uh, you could just search on YouTube right now and you'll find a lot of videos, of people teaching that Paul was not a true apostle. And, and uh, they, because they don't like the fact that Paul is emphasizing over and over and over again, no works are required, and if you add works as a requirement, you've ruined it all, it's worth nothing. That's Paul's primary message, and and the, the people who believe in lordship salvation, they can't stand that preaching, so they, 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 they try to do the same thing that these original Judaizers, is what the Bible calls them, the Judaizers challenge Paul's uh, apostleship, and now we also have another group of people that uh, this is a more modern problem, and, and these are the people who elevate Paul. They, not only do they say, Paul, yeah, Paul's a legitimate apostle, but they take it so far that they say he is the only apostle for the Gentiles. He's the only one that has the message of salvation for us today. They say you can't get saved by listening to uh, the words of Jesus or, or the, the book of John or only from Paul. So you have these extremes on both ends, that Paul's illegitimate or Paul is the only apostle. Um, so, um, but the, the, the truth of the matter is, that in the, first of all, I'm trying to make a point in, a few, in just a couple of minutes now that really takes me probably 30 or 40 hours to make in, in other playlists. Uh, I, I did a verse-by-verse 
uh, teaching on the book of Acts. Uh, I also did a, a, a lengthy teaching on comparing John and James, I mean, um, um, Paul and James. Uh, it's titled, The Shocking Facts About James and Paul. And, and then I also, uh, uh, I did another one uh, titled Early Church History. So uh, all of these really, these three playlists, they really are the focal point of each one of them, really the focal point of the book of Acts, is that when the f church first started, they didn't, they, there were two things they didn't know. They didn't know that um, the Gentiles will be included in this. That there'll be one body made up of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, that was the mystery that was revealed to Paul. That's what Paul, uh, when Paul defines what the mystery is, that's what he says it is. Even though some people today, they're saying that Paul, Paul's mystery is that, oh, now you don't have to work to get saved. Now it's just by grace and alone and faith alone. So they're totally misrepresenting what the mystery is. The mystery was they didn't know Gentiles would be part of it. That's number one problem in the beginning of church. The second problem that had to, it, it took years to get this all straightened out is that uh, Christianity is, is a new thing. It came out the seed of Abraham. It came from these people, but the, the religion of Judaism should not be part of Christianity. You cannot combine religious works with uh, Christianity. And that's, that's really the main message that Paul it, it, and I, I will give him credit more so than anybody else. He makes that point that not only are you saved simply by believing in Jesus for your salvation and, and, and his finished work paying for your sins on the cross, but if you add any other requirements like circumcision or dietary laws or the Sabbath or temple worship or animal sacrifices, all these things were the, the, the early uh, Jewish believers were trying to force all these things on on the church. And Paul, more than anybody else, was arguing that, no, you cannot make that part of the church. You've got to leave all that behind. So that's the, the main point I'd say that we need to understand, that this book of Galatians is primarily uh, Paul's arguing with these Jude Judaizers, are called. They're, they're the men from Jerusalem, uh, the the Paul calls them, and I think it's in Galatians, he, he refers to them, the men from, from James. And so the Jerusalem church was the primary place where this was coming from. And these uh, people from Judah, Judea, in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says that there's a group from, from uh, Judea, and they're saying, wait a second, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And that's... Acts chapter 15, verse 1, that's well into the, the, the church age, and they're still insisting you've got to be circumcised. And Paul and Silas, and, and I think there's a, a few others, I think there's a maybe Apollos or some, some uh, a Gentile, they take with them uh, and to have this council in, in uh, Jerusalem to, to debate all this and try to work it all out. Uh, so th that's the main thing. This, this problem beginning the church is that the Jewish believers insisted in the beginning that you got to practice Judaism. Basically, they're saying, you got to convert to Judaism, then you can believe in Jesus. And Paul stood up against that. Now, uh, now that's more broad. Uh, I've got things I want to say more specific about th this, this section of verses here, but I don't, want, I, I don't want to go on and on without giving you a chance to reply to anything I just said. Okay, uh, the, uh, it is interesting, this verse 3, because as much as I think that Paul and James uh, disagreed, uh, in verse 3 we can see that there, uh, this verse, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. This is exactly the same point that we find in James when he says uh, that... Um, if you keep the whole law, but uh, err in one point, you've, uh, you're guilty of all. It's exactly the same point. Uh, so in, in that respect, uh, they're certainly in agreement, saying that you've got to follow the law perfectly. Um, now, so this is, he's bringing up circumcised, the circumcision, because it's one of the claims 
that the Judaizers are making on the church, saying you must be circumcised. They didn't stop there, as I said. They, they, they were also insisting on the dietary laws. Even though when Peter was sent to Cornelius and his family, God revealed to Peter then that the dietary laws were over. Uh, but the verse 4, it says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. This is really the main thing for this, uh, I think, as far as just our, our doctrine. And that is that uh, if you think that being circumcised, uh, worshiping on a particular day, uh, following some set of religious rules like uh, the Mosaic laws or anything, if you think that any uh, set of rules and regulations is, is required of you and, and you're trying to impose that on others in order to get salvation, it says that Christ has, has become of no effect unto you. In other words, it, it, the, the effect that you want from Christ is your salvation. That's the effect we get when by believing in Christ. He says there's no effect. That means you're not going to get saved unless you get this right. Uh, if you're just, you think you're being justified by the law. Now, ye are fallen from grace. I asked you about that because, not because it just dawned on me, but because I've encountered a lot of lordshippers that will throw that verse and, uh, you know, anything they can find that they can allude to and say, well, see, you can actually lose your salvation. You can fall from grace. But it, it, it just, it just means that you're not under the grace of God. You're not, you, you're not going to have the grace of God if you believe that, uh, you're justified by the law. And we don't need to read any more into it than that. Uh, all right, brother. I'm, yeah, I'm, the, the worship salvation will teach, well, you can fall from grace by not submitting your will and doing all these works and persevering to the end, when actually Paul is teaching in Galatians 5 that the way that you fall from grace is by doing works, uh, mm -hmm. not the opposite. And we, you know, and you make that point in Galatians 2, you know, that we've uh, covered last video, 221, I do not frustrate the grace of God for righteousness to come by the law.
you know, you are following the true church and the commandments, these new laws that Jesus brought in when he established his church in Jerusalem in 33 AD. Therefore, you're not part of the true church. Therefore, you're not saved. And then the thing is, you know, these churches that teach stuff like that are so spiritually blind, they will use verses completely out of context. You know, we just talked about James 2.10, for instance, where it says, uh, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet I think in one point, he is guilty of all. And then they'll use that verse to say, well, if you're not doing everything in our church, what our church teaches, including not having musical instruments, just being an acapella, then that means you're offended at one point. You're guilty of everything. And they will completely miss the obvious point of James 2.10 because they're not saved. There's no spiritual discernment. Those are dead works churches. So just beware of all that. And, um, you know, if, if you see that type of teaching, um, you know, Paul warns the Galatian circumcision, I'm warning you of water baptism. <laughs> 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 comparing yourself to the Apostle Paul and uh, it, but it's it's really sad that, that people sometimes I had to deal with it earlier today as I was discussing with you that some people will listen to us with the whole goal of catching us misspeak or say one word out of place in order to come against us and uh, I had to deal with someone who did that to me today and he even said in the initial part of the comment that uh, he he was trying to find something and scrutinize every word to find something wrong, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, I think your point about saying what about baptism uh, today is is the circumcision of that day. I think that's a very valid point um, because it's it's part of a, like an, uh, let's say, a, an initiation. And circumcision back then was like being initiated into the uh, Judaism and water baptism, people think it's being initiated into Christianity. Um, but while we're on the subject of water baptism, um, let's, uh, because they're, they're, that's a very controversial subject too. Uh, you have, again, it's amazing how people, uh, the, the, the more, the older I get, brother, the more I become a moderate. I believe moder moderation, because it, it seems like everything is taken to, uh, opposite extremes. I talked about Paul's the great only apostle or Paul's not a real apostle. Those are opposite extremes. Uh, but with water baptism, you also have these two extreme positions. One is baptismal regeneration. Church of Christ and some others, they teach that you're not saved unless, unless you get wet. You've got to be dunked or sprinkled or probably dunked, but you've got to get wet to get saved. The, the water somehow uh, is brings you to life, regenerates you when you get wet. And then there are these Paul onlyists, they're so much uh, uh, against any kind of uh, work that they, they not only say that, no, um, you don't have to get water baptized to get saved. That's, you know, you're saved by faith alone. But I'm even telling you, they're, they're even telling you, don't you even dare think about getting water baptized. Um, uh, you've got to totally avoid it. You better stay dry. Otherwise, you're not going to be saved because you're putting some faith in that water and you're dividing your faith. So um, these people are, again, these two opposite extremes. But but what would you say is the middle ground that's actually the true position on, on water baptism for us? The act of water baptism is not in any way, shape, or form part of your salvation. But... We should do it as a commandment, um, as our initial step, as a follower of Christ, as a disciple of Christ. And it's something that you can use over time when you remember your baptism, say 10 years from the time when you truly trusted the gospel. And you had that moment where you trusted the 
gospel of Jesus Christ, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins and overcame death for you with his resurrection and gives you eternal life at that point. If you put your faith and trust in that, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise and you believe it's eternal. You can't lose it. And you go on to be baptized and within that next week as an initial step to show your faith to yourself, you know, to remind you of that initial step that you took. But seeing years down the road, say you got a divorce, things are falling apart, you lost your job, you hadn't gone to church in a while, you're hitting the bottle. You know, I mean, you could go down some road where you could always remember that time. Well, 10 years ago, I was baptized. I know I was baptized. And not to get saved, or that was part of salvation, but I remember my faith at that point in time, that it was strong, and now I'm weak in the faith. There's all these things that have obstacles in my life, but you can always go back to that point in time where you remember your baptism, uh, where you did have that conviction and that trust and that belief that you were resting and being assured in Christ that can help you in the future to overcome things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I've never really uh, heard it uh, explained in that way. Uh, the uh, uh, I think this uh, water baptism is a perfect example of the uh, the uh, let's say the uh, the compartments of must and should. Uh, in, in the compartment of must, uh, th- these are the things that you must do in order to get saved. And there's one thing in there. You believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. You, you believe in this person and the finished work of Jesus for your salvation, and that's it. And uh, then you have this other compartment, uh, should. Well, what, what should we do after we get saved? Well, there's a long list of things we should do. And, you know, uh, but um, the uh, this is definitely one. Water baptism is something we should do but not because we're required to do it and not because we put our faith in it for our salvation. We don't want to divide our faith and say, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe I must get wet. Then, then, you're, then your faith, uh, I would say that Christ has become of no effect unto you, as it says here in this verse. Uh, but uh, you, you should, be, matter of fact, not only should we be water baptized after we get saved, uh, but I look at it as what an opportunity it is, because uh, most people, when they first get saved, they're either not knowledgeable enough or not confident enough to go out and start preaching the gospel. Uh, but so uh, what can they do to proclaim the gospel? Uh, they can be water baptized publicly. They invite their friends, their family, everybody comes and attends their, their baptism. And in the baptism, the gospel's preached. This represents Jesus's death burial and resurrection and and, uh, and that's what the as, as we explain the water baptism it's a picture of our salvation so uh, it's a great opportunity for someone to uh, uh, give a testimony uh, through their water baptism um, all right now another thing that got me into trouble recently is uh, you know here I'm uh, I'm a Call myself a KJV firstist. We are, we're reading the KJV here, but I'm not afraid to look at other translations if, if sometimes it can help be helpful to me. But uh, but if it disagrees with the KJV, then uh, I use the KJV as my source of truth and the test of uh, what's correct. Uh, but sometimes modern English is, it can be helpful. And the one that I like to use is this amplified translation because it's more like uh, re- reading a commentary. It's, it amplifies it, it ex- 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 expounds upon it. And I like how they phrase this last part. In the KJV, it says, ye are fallen from grace. So we say, we're trying to explain, well, what does it mean, ye are fallen from grace? And they explain it, you have fallen from grace, that is, for you have lost your grasp on God's unmerited favor and blessing. And I think that's a sensible way to, interpret it that it, uh, you just kind of have you lost your grasp you, you don't you don't comprehend really have you forgotten about the grace and what it, what it means you know if you if you think and now you're dividing your faith and you came in 
the right way, believing only on Jesus. Now, now their Judaizers are telling you, you better get sick or circumcised. So, uh, and did you forget about the grace of God? That it's a free gift and you're not required to do anything? So, uh, I, I think, what do you think of that, the way they phrase it there? I like it. I think that enhances and fails, amplifies uh, that verse very well. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say about this before we go to the next verse? Uh, no, I think we can go on. Okay, the next one is 2 Timothy 1, verse 10. And it says, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And we can pick that verse up in verse 9, uh, because it's verse 10 is sort of um, preceding or following a, a comma. Um, that says, who has saved us, and this is speaking obviously of Jesus Christ, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. So, the Lamb of God, the promise of eternal life was was established, was given before the world began. Um, you know, Jesus Christ is eternal. He's the Alpha and Omega. He has no beginning and no end. Um, he's God, you know, and um, he's part of the triune Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we were talking about mysteries earlier. You know, people before the cross were looking forward to that Redeemer to fulfill Scripture and redeem them from their sins to be their Savior and um, overcome death for them. They knew that. They just didn't know how it was going to work, um, that he was going to die on the cross and, and arise again the third day. They didn't quite know that. Um, but now, that's been manifest. That's what verse 10 is saying. Um, that those promises in the scriptures since the creation are now made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. His appearing. He is our Savior. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, he abolished death. And this is the spiritual death. This is the second death. Um, and brings about life and immortality to life through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus Christ is now, the good news is here and eternal life is being brought forth. Now you know the meaning of how God who had this all planned since the beginning of, of creation you know, he knows the end from the beginning but over time, these mysteries of God were revealed more and more. And now, it's brought to light through the gospel, through the good news, the death, burial, resurrection. That was the means of how man received eternal life. Hmm. Yeah, I, one of the things I like about uh, studying with you is that you instinctively look at the preceding and the following verses and uh, bring it to my attention all the time. That actually, uh, uh, we were going to look at verse 10, and you said also look at 9, and 9 of the two, I, I might choose 9 over 10 for, for the, the purpose of our study. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, right there in the middle, not according to our works, mm -hmm. but according to the purpose of God. Great. Give it to us. Um, in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, those two go hand in hand. Yeah. And that verse is later on in the list of 101 verses. We should probably just add this as 102 later. 
Yeah, I uh, while we you were talking, I I went through our list and I added it verse nine to the. So it's it says verse nine and ten now on our, on my master copy. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let me go over this uh, more carefully. It says, who hath saved us? So it's referencing God has saved us. Uh, and it's, so it's saying that, hey, we are saved. It's, it's a past tense statement. It's done. He has saved us. Um, so we don't have to keep our fingers cro hoping Fingers crossed, hoping that someday we, we might get saved. It's, it's already been done. We, we have been saved. And, it's, and called us with a holy calling. Um, well, I think we, I'm not sure how to take that. It, I think it could be interpreted both ways. Uh, called us with a holy calling. It could be that it's, ho it's a holy calling because he is the one that's calling us. He's holy. Or it could be calling us with a holy calling because now that we're saved, they're saying, go and, go and be holy you know, and uh, do good. Um, but it says, following, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So clearly right here, it, it, it's um, um, totally uh, coming against the, the, the teaching that works are required. It says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So it's by grace, not by works, we see in this verse which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Uh, this, this has to do with just God's, uh, God's position in time. Uh, I've always, to me, I like watching a lot of sci-fi movies and things and, and the, the idea of time travel and the concept of time is it, fascinating to me, but my brain, I, maybe I'm not smart enough, but my brain gets like twisted in a pretzel trying to follow time and you know going back in the future and then back or into the future it's just amazing i cannot even talk about it because i'm so confused by time <laughs> but the point i'm making here is that i think it says before the world began is because um god is is not linear uh like we we think of time as and you know uh, uh here's our present and then there's a line going backwards to uh, and our past and line. It's, I, I look at it like this. Uh, you know, the, uh, not the digital type of movies, uh, but the old fashioned type of movies that's reel to reel. And a reel to reel movie is a series of snapshots. And, but, but it's, uh, it's a snapshot taken so closely together, they're just a split second apart. And, um, so if, if, if your life could be expressed that way, where every split second of your, let's say one one hundredth of a second from your first breath, every one one hundredth of a second, a picture was taken of your life. And then they were strung together. And then that, that, that is stretched out linearly. Um, see, that's how we see it. But God's not on the line. God's outside of the line. God can see the entire line from beginning to end. All the time uh, so we're always at some point on the line you know um, well before I go on uh, let me see if you have anything to say about that concept before I go to the next verse yeah that, that also blows my mind too um, it's hard for me to capture that I'm missing and being outside of time you know um, that's just part of the the glory of God, you know, if, if we worship the God that we fully understood, you know, we, he wouldn't be God, you know, I mean, he is outside, um, you know, our, our, um, his thoughts are above our thoughts, you know. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I've often thought, uh, again, it just shows you how my intellect is nothing. Uh, I, to, I really even comprehend God, but I, I'm wondering, to me, one of the thrills of living is uh, something new happening every day that I, I don't know about. I don't know ahead of time. It's it's a new thing. It's a surprise, and I learn things new all the time. God doesn't learn anything. He knows everything. God's never surprised. He always knows what's going to happen. And it just I'm thinking, God, God, do you ever get bored? You just know everything already. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, let's go to verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, but is now made manifest. Uh, I don't know. Let me look at the Amplified to see what it says about that, because I'm not getting what that means. It says, but now that extraordinary purpose and grace has been dis fully disclosed, okay, and realized by us through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. All right. I think that, that explains it well for me. And it says, who hath abolished death? Uh, now, of course, we know that death, it says hath, so it, it's already been done. He's abolished death, but people are still dying. So maybe you can explain that to me, uh, your take on that. It's, uh, it says he's already abolished death, but we know we're, we're still dying. Someday we're going to have eternal life. It says, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Uh, that relates to my viewpoint on, uh, you know, conditional immortality. That's a position that, that I hold that is, uh, people, always assume, and I think it's because everybody was taught that man has an immortal soul uh, and that uh, after we die, since the soul is immortal, we have to live forever somewhere. Well, brother, you and I are going to live forever in heaven, right? But uh, the person who doesn't put their faith in Jesus, if their soul is going to live forever, where is he going to live? So the default, of course, is they're going to be tortured forever in hell is what many people think. Uh, but uh, my teaching is what is the state of the dead? We talk a lot about conditional immortality. And I think the Bible tells us, uh, this verse here kind of doesn't state it clearly, but it's alluding to it, hath brought life and immortality. Now, you wouldn't have to bring immortality if, if a man was innately immortal. Um, the, the scripture says that uh, uh, we're mortal and we put on immortality when we put our faith in Jesus. We, I think that's how it's phrased. Uh, so, uh, because of the gospel, because of the good news, because of what Jesus has done for us and the promises he's made in this free gift of salvation, we get to be immortal. Uh, okay, brother, any more thoughts on, on all this? Okay, yeah. Meaning everybody's born in the flesh, but if you're only born in the flesh, you're not spiritually reborn or put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you not only die in the flesh, but you also have that second death, spiritual death. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are born twice in the flesh and in the spirit, then you only die once. You avoid that second death because you are in Christ. Christ is immortal, he brings you immortality. Uh, and he brings it to life through the gospel. I've been watching some of the videos that you just previously, previously mentioned and um, am very interested to continue learning on um, that topic, uh, you know, that, that you brought about uh, conditional immortality and things like that. You know, just looking briefly over the past week or two at these videos and uh, looking at a little bit of scripture with it, I think, um, you know, that's probably the viewpoint that I am uh, currently embracing in which I really haven't talked too much before about. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I'm glad you're looking at that. I, I wish everybody um, would have an attitude that, um, hey, uh, we're discussing some theological subject and, and uh, we disagree. Well, let me learn more about your position. Let me I will tell, tell me exactly what you believe and how you believe, and let me listen to it carefully. Uh, I, I'll shut up. I'm not going to talk or argue. I just want to listen so I can understand what you believe. And then, in turn, uh, afterwards, I'll tell you what I believe, and you can listen to me. How, how can it hurt for people to listen to each other and give each other a fair hearing? And in that way, uh, the worst thing that we have that could happen is that we, well, we... We, we still don't agree, but at least we understand each other's positions better now. But it's, it's rare. That kind of attitude is rare. It's sad to me. But uh, Hey, you said something about uh, if a man's born twice. Now, 
Come on, how can a man be born twice? Can he go back inside his mother's womb? Come on, Nicodemus, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Okay, shall we go to another verse now? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay. Uh, How are we doing all time? Uh, let me see. Time is 45 minutes, so we got 15 minutes okay, left. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next one is, uh, where am I? Gee. Okay, 9 and 10, yeah. Uh, now it's First John. 4, 14. Okay, it says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It's worth repeating and emphasizing that uh, this uh, is written by the Apostle John, uh, one of the twelve apostles who who was with John with with Jesus from the very beginning of his his uh, ministry, uh, who was the only one that was faithful to even be there at his trial and at, and at the foot of the cross, the only one, and he's even referred to as the beloved apostle. He's the author of the Gospel of John and these three epistles of John. And um, so if anybody should know, it would be him. He was there with Jesus more than any of the others, in some ways closer than any of the others, an eyewitness. And uh, he even says in at the, near the end uh, of his uh, Gospel account, the Gospel of John, he says... The reason I'm writing this book 
is to teach you how to get saved. So that's the whole purpose of the book of John, to teach us how to get saved. And yet today, as I said, there's it's, it's a problem that's uh, very modern. It's only really been like the last 100 years of church history of the Paul Onlyus that say you can't get saved by reading the Gospel of John. Only Paul. Uh, but uh, John says he wrote the book to teach us how to get saved. And then, uh, and then in 1 John, he says the reason he's writing that book is to, to, to give us uh, blessed assurance, to, to, to give us certainty. See, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So you don't have to question and have doubts and, and worries and, and just keep your fingers crossed. But you, he wants us to have certainty and assurance and a guarantee. So uh, that's the Apostle John. And uh, uh, he says, oh, I'll read this in the Amplified because it makes a couple of good points here. It says, we who were with him in person have seen and testify as eyewitnesses that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, one last point about being the Savior, I think, is that uh, uh, there's some things that, to me, are so simple. I, I'm just, I, I'm befuddled how a person could come to the wrong conclusion. How could a person believe that Jesus is their Savior and not believe that he's the one that's saving them? It's all up to him to save us instead of thinking that, no, they got to work their way up to heaven. Uh, they don't really believe Jesus is the Savior who's going to grab them and pull them up to heaven. Through his effort, not through not through their own labors, you know. That's what it means that he's our savior. That's what it means to be saved. It means that he's doing it. We're not. All right, brother. Amen. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, I think we have time for another. Uh, we got eight minutes. We got time for another verse uh, and then a summary. Yeah, we can do one more. Okay. Okay. So this one is. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.10. Okay. okay. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Okay, brother. Well, this goes hand in hand with the verse we just mentioned. I think these are probably going back to back because um, it's showing that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, as we just saw in First John four fourteen. Uh, here uh, it says the same thing, just instead of Savior of the world, Savior of all men. And how do we? Receive that salvation through Jesus Christ and through trust, trust in Him, uh, especially of those that believe. Yeah, especially meaning, you know, singling out out of the all men that He is the Savior over, that it still takes that free will of placing your faith and resting in Jesus Christ. This is a teaching universalism that everybody's saved. Um, is teaching that Jesus Christ came, God manifested in the flesh, because God so loved the world. I mean, God wants all men to come to repentance, to come to Him, and to have eternal life through His Son. But it's up to you to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You can't receive God's love, His grace, His mercy, without putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so, you know, it's especially those who believe it exclusively, it's specifically those who believe. I mean, that who ultimately he saves from that second death that God saves. Now, it's for everybody. Um, but it takes to receive God's grace, his love, his mercy, and the free gift of eternal life. You have to put your faith and just simply trust that he did it for you, that he overcame death for you through his death, burial, and resurrection, and rest in it and not add anything to it. 
Don't add your works to it. Don't add any religious zeal and effort and water baptism and circumcision and going to church three times a week and confessing your sins and repenting of all your sins. None of that has anything to do with salvation. It's all what Jesus Christ did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you explained it very well. Uh, I would say you got the two parts of the verse, the Savior of all men, and then especially of those that believe. And people could easily misconstrue that either accidentally or, or on purpose. But uh, I think the, the first part and the second part is, is a distinction between um, uh, the, uh, uh, if, 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 if uh, availability versus the effectuality. In other words, he's the savior of all men and that his, that his salvation is available to all men. But only those that believe, is it effectual? Does it really kick in and, okay, you're going to get saved now because you recognize that he's the savior and you want it and you received it. Uh, the footnote here, uh, it says, God is the savior of all mankind in the sense that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient for the entire world. However, personal faith is essential for salvation. That's explained very succinctly there. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You didn't make any comment about my words uh, being uh, available versus effectual. Oh, I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that. I just thought of that. I thought, man, that's a good way of expressing it. <laughs> All right then. How well, how well you did that. I mean, it's almost like you've said that before. Yeah, no, I've never said it. Actually, it just dawned on me then that I've never used that term. But uh, uh, I, I believe that sometimes, you know, we, we the words that come out are inspired, and, and then that we get epiphanies or revelations from God as we're studying, and. Uh, uh, I believe that's a really good way. That's why I wanted to bring it up again, because I thought that's really the way to distinct between these two points, to make the distinction. Um, all right, so let's go. Uh, we're finished with the verses, I guess. Let me see the time that's left here. Yeah, we have uh, like two minutes left. I think it's just enough time for you to uh, uh, kind of summarize the study as you, as you uh, always do. Another um, several verses that really show the point that it's not of ourselves, it's not of what we do, it's what Jesus Christ did. Um, beginning with Galatians 5, this is what Paul is teaching to the church of Galatia, saying, you know, if you add to the grace of God through Jesus Christ and his finished work, then you fall into a grace. You know, his finished work is, is of no effect to you. Um, you know, you're, it, it's as if Christ died in vain, that his, his sacrifice for you was futile because you're not trusting in it fully. You're adding your own words also. And that's telling God that his sacrifice, what he did for you, isn't good enough for you. So you need to turn from that, those dead works that you're doing, and fully rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Um, and Paul made that point uh, in Second Timothy. I like that we added verse 9 to verse 10, because I think that is the key verse uh, with this study that we're doing on faith alone and not on works. And then the last two verses um, show that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, the Savior of all men, and how do we receive salvation? That free gift of eternal life is through believing and trusting in God, and that's by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. Um, so, uh, again, the time flies by when you're having so much fun talking about Jesus and the Bible with a brother. But um, I would say to the viewer, uh, hopefully, just from this study alone, you should understand uh, 
the gospel. That means that's Greek for good news. The good news is that uh, even though you could never go to heaven based on your personal merit, the Bible says that no one could possibly be good enough to earn heaven. So, uh, but God loves you so much that he'll give you eternal life in heaven as a free gift if you just trust Jesus. So it's important to understand that you're not going to go to heaven because of the things you do. You're going to go to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. He, he died for your sins. And uh, you're not going to go to heaven because of who you are. You're such a good person. No, you're going to go to heaven because who Jesus is. He is your God and your Savior. All right, so thank you for watching. And uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.